Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar. My name is Jeff Fraser. I work in the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here at Geoscience Australia. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land and community. Pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. For today's seminar, our speaker is Dr. David Mole, and his presentation is titled Isotopic Mapping, Unraveling the Evolution of the Earth's Continents and its Influence on Mineral Systems. David completed his Master's in Geology at University College London in the UK in 2007. He then moved to Australia to undertake a PhD at University of Western Australia, investigating the influence of coastal architecture on Kamatiite formation, localization of nickel copper element deposits. Completed his PhD in 2012 and then went on to do postdoctoral research at Curtin University at CSIRO and then on to Laurentian University in Canada. In 2021, last year, he joined our team at Geoscience Australia as a geochronologist and isotope geochemist. His research focus for the last 16 or so years has been understanding large scale coastal architecture using the spatial application of geochemistry and geochronology and how this can be applied to understanding the distribution of mineral systems. So today we're going to hear about how he's used these methods in some of his work conducted prior to joining to Geoscience Australia, and then how he's applying these approaches as part of current and future Geoscience Australia work. So please welcome David to the podium. And while David's coming up, could I ask that the people uh, tuning in online, just please ensure that you are muted in Teams and that your camera is off, because this helps with the bandwidth. So welcome, David. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate taking time every day to come and talk. So, like Jeff said, today we're going to talk about isotopic mapping and particularly how we use it to unravel the evolution of the Earth's continents and understand the mineral systems. So, the, the main focus is going to be how we use the isotopic mapping to understand plus architecture. And coastal architecture is effectively the framework of coastal blocks in the upper part of the lithosphere. And we can imagine that framework kind of like a jigsaw. So if we can map all the different jigsaw pieces, we can understand the whole puzzle. We also know that all deposits kind of like to be at the edge of those little jigsaw pieces. So if we can map the whole thing, we can hopefully understand where the all deposits be. And we tend to try and map that um, architecture using zircon. So this is zircon on the left here. And it's a pretty amazing mineral and a bit of a fan, as you can probably imagine. We can use it to find so many things. We can understand the age of the rock. We can understand whether it has an oxidized or hydrous source, understand whether it came from the mantle or the crust, and we can then map that to understand spatial variation in those properties. So it's pretty amazing that we can understand something as large as the continents using something so small. These grains are only 50 to 30 microns long. So um, it's pretty special for that. I'd also like to acknowledge my contributors over the years. Um, without this, without them, this research would not. So I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the Ngunnawal Nambu people in Canberra, and the traditional, they're the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today. Pay respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here today. Also paying respects to your elders. I'd like to also like to acknowledge First Nations people in Canada. We're going to be talking about some research that I did there during my. So a quick outline what we're going to talk about. We'll start off the first third of the talk is going to be talk about the continental crust. What is the continental crust? What does it look like? How do we understand it? Because it does tend to be quite complex, especially as we get into some of the older rocks like in the Archean. And we'll get more into kind of the research data heavy part of the talk. So I'll try and be a little bit gentle with. Talk about why is our topic mapping special? The real special thing about it is that the maps that we produce are time resolved, so we can actually look at the architecture at the time the rocks were forming, at the time the mineral systems were developing. Whereas geophysical methods, even though they're really powerful in their own right, they look at the crust today. So you can imagine if we look at isotopic mapping and combine it with geophysical mapping, that those two systems work really nicely together. We know that crustal architecture has a first order control of mineral systems because there's been lots of research done in that space over the last 10, 20 years. And I'll show some examples from highly mineralized areas, such as the Yildan and Superior, where we have world-class mineral systems. And we start to understand 
the relationships we expect from um, cross architecture and where we tend to find these world clusters. And take this learning and we'll apply it to a less mineralized and a largely covered system. And that'll be in Southeast Australia. And that's the work we're currently doing here at GA and exploring for the future. So starting off, just a little bit of an overview of the Earth content. When the Earth formed, the whole planet was a magma ocean, but surprisingly rapidly it started to differentiate into the layers we see here. As most people know, there's the uh, solid inner core. We have a liquid outer core, the mantle, which is by far the largest volume of material on Earth. And then the very thin skin on the outside of the planet is the crust. Um, you imagine that the Earth is an apple, then the crust would be the skin. That's the kind of scale that the crust is, but it's obviously incredibly important because it's our surface environment. Facts and figures about the crust, it's typically felsic, so it's silica rich, it's less dense, and it tends to kind of float on top of the mantle, for lack of a better word. Um, it's typically 30 to 50 kilometers thick, but in mountainous areas such as the Himalayas and areas it can be as thick as 70 kilometers, it represents 40% of the Earth's surface, and but 70% by volume because it's um, less dense than the oceanic crust, which is matrix. So as I said, the crust only represents 1% of the whole volume of the Earth, but it, it's unique to our planet. It's the only planet we know that has terrestrial planet that has um, crust or continental crust, I should say. Um, it's our terrestrial land environment. Without the crust, we probably have no exposed landable sea level. The weathering of the crust when it did become ex exposed really was massively important to draw down CO2 and methane in the atmosphere and allow the rise of oxygen. Very hard to destroy because it's so because it's less dense, it can't be subducted. So it means it basically becomes a time capsule for geological information in the Earth. And one of those important things it preserves is ore deposits. It allows for formation, storage, and also ultimately our access to them. Um, that's massively important. What does the crust actually look like? It ranges from very complex gneissic rocks, and they, they tend to be particularly old, or they've been through many deformation events or high temperature events. And the complexity of course tends to increase over time, as you can imagine. Here, this is the Acastan ice, the oldest piece of crust we know about on Earth. It's four billion years old. And you can see in this picture we have pretty complicated textures. And there's banding, there's looks of the different types of melt, there's possible melt patches. So very complex rock. You should expect something so old. As we take crust from its initial formation phase, as a granite potentially, thermal effects start to change the rock. So as we maybe bury it or it gets heated up, we start to have banding. And this is an example from of a nice from the uh, Superior province. This is 2.7 billion years old. And as we increase the temperature further, as, uh, as the rock gets buried, then we, start, we may start to melt it and we create complex rocks like this, which are potentially magnetites and have many, maybe different, many different melt phases. These, these melts eventually rise and can become cooled and homogenized and produce rocks that actually are quite simple and belie their complex um, origin. And this is a typical Monza granite, which you see all over Archie and Cratons, and you actually get a bit bored of them because <laughs> you just see so many of them, but they are fundamentally what the crust is. But we know from the previous pictures that the ultimate origin can be quite complicated. Just to highlight, most of the samples we're going to talk about, Plymouth or them, are from rocks like this. The rocks that make up the maps I'm going to show you are made up of crustal rocks, and these rocks are examples and the medium we use to represent the content of crust in the maps. So based on what I've been saying and, and the different pictures I've shown, how can we investigate these rocks, which are clearly quite complicated and have a complex um, prehistory? So we use Zircon, and many people around the world use Zircon. We often think of it as the Earth's timekeeper because it's so it's so reliable as a geochronometer. It's our most robust and reliable geochronometer, probably. It, it can stay closed up to over 1,000 degrees centigrade. It's based on the uranium that system. So basically, as uranium will decay to um, lead over a, a very metronomic rate, so we, we can measure the amount of radiogenic lead. We can back calculate to figure out how old the mineral and rock is. So it's extremely resistant to resetting and alteration and radiation damage, so it really survives over billions and billions of years in a pristine state. It also allows couple measurements of other isotopic systems, such as hafnium and oxygen, which I'll talk about in the upcoming slides. 
that will tell us quite a lot about different elements, not just the age, but the origin and source of, of the melt that formed the zircon. It's true power realising the grain scale level of the information. So we can imagine if we date a whole load of zircons, we plot their different ages on a diagram like this, just a Concordia plot, and the ages are shown along the blue line here. So we've got three different groups here we've measured, and that one of them is about 500 million years, that's the crystallization age, and the other two are inherited ages. Now, we, if we were to crush that rock up and do a whole rock analysis, say of neodymium isotopes, we would end up with one point at the crystallization age. Still very useful in its own right. In this example, it would tell us that this crust had a rework to an old component. But if we did that, we know there's two parts missing here. We know that there's older components of this rock that we haven't really touched on with this analytical technique. If we did hafnium, which is a very similar technique to neodymium in terms of what the isotopes tell us, but we can measure individual grains and then we get a picture of what's happening over a much longer period of time. We get to see the whole picture of the history of the, the rock itself. So zircon, as I was been saying in the previous slide, it really tells us much more than just the age. It has kind of a toolbox of different um, information we can use to understand crustal evolution. First thing, obviously, is the geochronology. As I said, it's the most reliable system. It does allow in situ dating, so we can use iron probe, like the one we have downstairs here at GA, to measure the age of distinct minerals or even zones within the mineral. And it provides the ultimate temporal context. So without the actual age, we can't put any of the rest of the information in context. The oxygen isotopes, this is essentially the ratio of 18-0 to 16-0. Most of oxygen on Earth is 16 0, but the very small amount of 18 and the ratio between 9 and 16 is really important in terms of understanding the temperature of the fractionation that may form that particular source. So, for example, then low temperature fractionation occurs on the ocean floor, high temperature fractionation occurs in hydrothermal systems, and we can track that using oxygen isotopes, and I'll explain that a bit more. You can also use hafnium isotopes, and we'll talk quite a bit about these throughout the talk. This is the ratio of 176 hafnium to 177, and essentially, it's based on the premise that the mantle is 176 lutetium rich. This decays to 176 hafnium. We end up with a radiogenic mantle, radiogenic crust. When melts form from those two sources, we can track their evolution by analyzing this isotope ratio in zircon. The final thing we look at is trace elements. This is not a nice topic technique, obviously, but zircon has a lot of trace elements um, at the levels we can measure. Particularly, we tend to use uranium, titanium, and cerium in combination to look at oxygen fragacity. We look at titanium for, to understand the temperature of the magma formed at. Europium tells us about hydration. We can understand fractionation. There's, there's a whole host of different things we can do with trace elements, but the one I'm going to mainly focus on is looking at this one here, oxygen fragacity. Bear in mind that the trace elements really is a growing field and all things. We so we're going to go through an example now, just kind of how we use this technique in a rock or on a particular grain. Grain, this grain could be from zircon, it could be 300 microns long, 200 microns. We can see that it has essentially three different zones. These represent three separate growth zones. We can date each one of those zones by putting an iron beam onto each different zone and then measuring the age. So this will give us, it's a little bit small, give us three different ages. And now we know the the temporal context and the age of the rock. Zones. So now we can do oxygen isotopes. We use an iron probe for this as well, and we can measure the exact same zones using the iron beam. Either in this example, uh, three different types of oxygen isotopes. Typically, we show oxygen as DAL 18O, which is the difference between 1816 isotopes. When we have these values above the mantle range, we tend to call those heavy. And they represent a low temperature fractionation source, which is something usually in sediments or supercrustal material. And when the value is less than mantle, it usually represents a high temperature um, component. And that's usually hydrothermal activity, interaction with hydrothermal rocks or hydrothermal system, or it can be interaction with meteoric water, which has a very uh, negative value. So in this example, we can see that there's been potentially some high, high temperature activity in the oldest component for the rest just as a sedimentary component, but no mantle component in this example. Now we can move on to do the hafnium in these different zones. We use laser ablation to do this, so we laser different zones as I've shown here. We tend to use a, have to use a bigger beam for this, so usually around 50 microns. 
and then we produce data like this. So th these plots show the epsilon haplium, which essentially tells us whether positive values tell us whether something is juvenile or mantle derived, or whether if, if it's negative, then the crust is tend to be older or have an enriched component or rich mantle component. And we, we look at this relative to essentially the depleted mantle, which evolves over time right here, and the chondrite um, reference line. So in this example, we can see that the older grains are more juvenile, and over time, the crust has essentially been reworked. Presented by model ages. So if we take this example, and we progress the hafnium isotope ratio along a particular lutetium hafnium ratio, which represents typical continental crust. We then get back to the intersection with the mantle, which says this piece of crust ultimately formed from the mantle, uh, in this case, 1800 million years ago. But that's the model age. But we can also have multiple interpretation. If we want to use some of our older material, we can see that the model age may be older and that this trend in the hafnium isotopes in this example here is, is a response to juvenile magmas mixing with an older source which is represented by possibly greater than 2100 MA crust. So happy to give us a lot of information, a lot to think about, but it tells us a lot about the crust. Moving on to trace elements, we also get this information from laser ablation and looking at the uranium, serum and uh, titanium ratios, we combine those to form what is um, essentially oxygen fugacity. This is oxygen fugacity relative to the phthalate -like magnetite quartz buffer. Don't worry about the details too much. And basically, anything above zero is oxidized, particularly if it's above one. Most arc magmas are above one. And anything below zero is reduced magma. And obviously, this is really important for mineral systems because some metals, anyway, particularly copper and gold, are transported readily in oxidized magmas. So this is an example of just how powerful one grain of zircon could potentially be. And we often do this for many grains over many samples. We have a systematic approach to this now. Basically understood the age of the rock, the context of it within the Earth, Earth history, whether there's a surface source, the temperature information of that source, whether there's a mantle or crustal origin, and ultimately the oxidation state, all from just these in situ techniques of the zircon. So over the course of this talk, we're going to go to a two, few different places, places that I've managed to be lucky enough to work over the last 10 years, 15 years, and give examples of how I've used our topic mapping essentially. So the first place we'll go is the Yilgarn. I spent my PhD here and did a postdoc here, so lots of nice memories. This is tend to be what some of the outcrops look like. Flat pavements of kind of uh, scrabbly granites, but they tend to be better than they look. Most people who work to the yoga and have a story of being bogged at some point. It's always great, obviously, when there's lots of witnesses <laughs> to when you, whenever you get bogged. But yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful place. After that, we're going to move to the Superior Creation in Canada. Very different um, environment, lots more water. You know when you've got a chimney in the place you're staying in summer, that's going to be cold. It's not always a good sign. It's going to be cold. And I, def I do not miss the black flies, which were pretty... Um, intense some parts of field season but they got to work with some great people this is phil thurston and jean gutier um we did some great field trips there it's a beautiful place final place will be close to home of australia this is probably i mean really just start working here but probably the most diverse environment in terms of the landscapes um this is the flinders ranges shown here the grampians in victoria kernamona province mostly very sandy and then this is the road to Broken Hill. So these are the places we're going to go over the course of the talk. Um, so kind of getting into now the, the real kind of sciencey part, I suppose. What is the history of isotopic mapping? Well, I thought it'd be nice to show some of the old pieces that I could find. And this is one, this is quite a well-known map of the Western US. And Don DePaolo, who was one of the, I guess, famous um, isotope geoscientists, he, um, mapped out the adenium contrast across the western US and showed that the accreted terrain is much more juvenile and is a significant margin, architectural margin, against what is the Wyoming craton further to the east in the US there. Very similar work was done in the Grenville, where um, it was shown that there's a significant amount of Archean superior craton underneath parts of the Granville and the architecture there as well. 
these are some of the early maps, but these are mostly done by point data. Um, at least it did show very early on. This is quite seminal work, really, looking back, you know, 34 years. It's a powerful technique in understanding crystal blocks. And, and now we have many different isotopic maps uh, from different regions, places all over the world. An example from West Africa. I'm from Dave Houston's work. This is the lab map from the Abitibi. Dave was obviously a GA. An example from, from, the, uh, from Tibet, and this is a really nice piece of work that shows how porphyries are locate, really localized into the more juvenile zones of Tibet. An example from Southeast Asia. There's been a lot of really good isolate mapping done in um, Asia and China. And of course, we have the Australia wide map, which is done by Dave Champion. And it's it's worth taking a special, uh, it's, it's worth a special mention for Dave because him and Kevin Cassidy really pioneered this this technique, the Ilgon, um, how we contour isotopic data and use it in a more predictive way than just doing point data. So, yeah, special mention to Dave for that. So we'll start from the Ilgon craton. This is a geological map, a basic geological map of the Ilgon. It's an Archean craton. It's the second largest in the world. Um, Mostly we need to just worry about the, the eastern gold fields, understand where that is, and the UMU terrain to the west, separated by the Ida Fault, which is a fairly major structure here. The thing about the Ilgon, if you work there, is there's granite, a lot of granites all over the craton, you see on the map. A lot of them have quite similar ages, most of them around 2680, 2640 million years, and geochemistry is subtly different, but mostly broadly the same, quite similar. There is subtle groups and Dave Champion was again seminal in understanding those. So the question is, and this is really kind of what, what Dave and Kevin were, were thinking about when they originally did this work. How can we understand these spatial variations in the granites if there's these similarities? So they mapped the Dinim isotopes and found that there was a significant difference between the western part of the crater and the eastern part. So this map shows juvenile um, younger crust in the west, the hotter colours. In the east, sorry, and um, older rework crust in the west, and then a, a small um, juvenile belt here, which we often refer to as the Q zone. So, this architecture is really important. And Dave made the original map, and in my PhD, I, I added data to the south, to the southern part here. Um, and I also start to look at the correlation with mineral systems. So, system, you see that most of the gold is localized to the hotter colours, the juvenile zones, orogenic gold. The nickel systems are localised mostly into the, the edge of the older zone and in our area, the hotter colour. The iron systems, iron ore systems, which are bit hosted, they're, um, they're antithetic to the other systems, so they're forming in the older parts of the craton and on the edge of the older parts. So in this, this centre part is where some of the um, iron ore systems are actually mined. The result of this work really is that crystal architecture appears to have this broad first order control on mineral systems at large scale. It seems to have a way to image it and map it, which is really important if we want to take this into an exploration space. So then as my PhD went on, we decided that, okay, the real problem we were aimed, aiming to solve was, can we understand the location of the 2.9 GA commodities in the Yogan, which is shown in blue, the 2.7 GA commodities and these, the mineral systems in the 2.7 GA system are world class nickel systems. So, really important to understand them, especially now given that nickel is such an important part of future green technologies and considered a critical mineral in its own right, I think, now. So, we want to understand can isotopic mapping help understand why these different ages are localized, how they are? What we realized, because they're both at different ages, we need to understand the architecture at each time. So we need to essentially make snapshots of crustal architecture. That's where we decided mapping data that we have, where we essentially group the data by its, its zircon age. And the result was um, we can image crustal evolution through time. So in case anybody's wondering what a Kamatia is, I thought I should explain that. They are extremely high temperature lavas, over 1600 degrees in temperature. So this is actually a lava flow from Hawaii and East. Lower East Rift. This is not Camarchite, but it's the closest thing we probably have in terms of temperature. But if you imagine Camarchite would have been 400 degrees hotter than this. Um, the Camarchites have very low viscosity, 
they probably flow in like olive oil, it's probably the right viscosity. So you can imagine something flowing turbulently that was blue hot and particularly on the water, because the Archean was a water world, that's kind of what Kamal Church would have been, but they had flow fields very similar to the nickel systems in WA formed in environments not too dissimilar from um, this video here. Produced some really beautiful textures. This is Finifex texture here. This is an example from Barberton, the type section for Kamal Church. Importantly for us, they form these nickel systems. So this is a, a section um, sample here. The base of, is the is the basaltic foot wall of the deposit. This is the massive sulfide and then the Kamati on top. So the nice thing about this sample is this is actually the base of a 2.7 billion year lava flow. Time slice mapping. We first want to look at the 2.9 deposit. So we produced a crustal architecture at that time. And we can see that we have older older crustal blocks in these areas and in the central part we have more juvenile crust if we show the comatiites now we, they're going to be shown in red and the larger the circle the higher mgo higher mgo comatiites tend to produce better nickel systems you see that the both of the red dots there and the stars of nickel deposits are localized against this old fusel crust here and considering that most of the granites in the yorgon are not the say this is really built on inherited groups of zircons and, and older samples. It shows kind of what you can really do with um, the full sweep information from a granite. We then look at the 2.7 GA time size. Can we see that the crustal blocks in the, the older time size have kind of amalgamated together and we formed a more coherent crustal um, protocontinent potentially. And the margin has shifted further to the east. We have more juvenile crust here. Now are forming on the edge of the margin. So, two separate times and two separate locations, we're seeing the Comarchite systems being localized along the growing margin of the craton. How do we think that happens? Ultimately, we think that a plume comes from underneath, obviously, hits the base of the lithosphere and is then localized. The base of the sphere is not homogenous, it's localized into different areas. So, in this example, this area over here will be the more juvenile crust, it's thinner, and over here will be the more reworked thicker, thicker crust with the, the corresponding lithosphere, and the plume is concentrated into the thinner area, and that's where we get these really big catastrophic volcanic events. So toward the end of my PhD, I was I've been collecting data all the way through, and we started to get quite a big data set. We started to make updated maps, so these are the kind of final maps that we'll publish. Um, unfortunately, quite a bit after my PhD was finished, but they were <laughs> actually published. Um, this is the 2.9 time slice, the final version. And we can see that what we're, we the architecture very similar to what I showed in the initial map. Interpret these juvenile areas here as potentially rift zones. Seven architecture, we can see that we have another rift zone here on the edge of the old block. Then if we look at the gold systems again shown in yellow on the Neodymium map, and we plot those three um, rift systems of different ages together. We see that they essentially intersect. The analysis of the gold there. So it's a very empirical correlation between architectures of different times coming together potentially to make a world class deposit. It really shows that geological activity that happened three in years before the formation of the ore system was actually really important in um may be really important in generating what is an, a huge gold system so that's the end of the uh, yogan section we're going to move on to the superior now this work was done as part of the metal earth project in canada which is a really big um academic research project 100, over 100 million dollars and it's it, we have quite similar programs to we, we had quite similar programs to um what we do here at GA and when I was at Metal Earth, I actually came to GA for a visit to, to kind of understand how we, we do things here. So there's a, this combined geology, geophysics, geochemistry component where we link, try and integrate, link everything together. And the ultimate aim is to um, resolve all systems right on to the positive scale. Right on scale. So the idea was to map the craton like I did in the Yilgarn as much as possible. Um, and I decided to add oxygen isotopes from trace elements and zircon to try and keep pushing the system forward and the, the technique forward. And the goal was again very similar to the Yorgon, build that time space evolution to create on, 
understand the architecture and relate all that back to the mineral systems um, space and time. The data set ended up being over 300 samples and over 19,000 analyses, so over three years. So it was a big, big project. What about this? This is the, in blue is the final suite of data. We only managed to do the Southern Superior, but I'll show what we did in the Superior um, in this presentation. This is the area itself. In blue, all the samples that we collected, and the Abitibi is the main area to, to think about. This is the main mineralized area and probably the biggest greenstone belt on Earth, if not, and probably the best preserved. So the, the main thing to think about in terms of geological history, because I'm going to refer to it probably a few times without even thinking, is that the Sin volcanic period in this area of the, the Superior is anywhere from over 2750 to 2695. That's when the volcanic greenstone belt period of the geology is happening. Then after 2695, we move to less, vul less volcanism and mostly uh, intrusive um, magnetism. But there is a small amount of volcanism around, but it's mostly intrusive. We refer to those as symbolic and post volcanic periods. Getting into the isotopic data, this is the hafnium data. So we can see that the majority of the data set is around 2.7. There's basically two components here. There is the older component, which forms along this model age line here. So these are eventually evolution lines, which tell us, like I said, in the initial part, the beginning part of the talk, kind of when the crust was initially extracted from the mantle. So there's this old component here, and there's also a very juvenile component near the depleted mantle. And we think that the result of most of the crust is mixing between those two components, but it, it is fair to say that the majority of the crust is very juvenile in the, in the southeast superior. You can also see there's quite a significant shift, a decrease in the values around 2.7. Yeah, spatially, we can we, in this case I plot the model age. So in the hotter colours again, it's the most juvenile crust. You can see that the vast majority of the ore deposits shown in these symbols are very concentrated into the juvenile zone, just like we saw in in the Yildar. And what we see the most juvenile parts of the crust are in this area here, which is often called the southern volcanic zone. We interpret this as a rift zone, which really localised a lot of the VMS systems. And really, in the Abitibi, it's all about VMS. Mostly in the gold systems are there too, but they're later. And there's a whole host of world-class VMS systems and they tend to be gold rich as well. Moving on to the oxygen isotope data, what we see here is broadly this mantle-like values are slightly heavier than mantle at 42.7 in the symbolcanic period. And then around 2.7, we see the shift to heavier values. See that in the central part of the, of the area, we have the lowest oxygen isotope value. So in the hotter colours, they tend to be lower. So a mantle-like or lower than that, suggesting high temperature hydrothermal activity. And in the east and the west, we tend to have more crustal-like values. So this oxygen really mat nicely matches what we see in the hafnium. Most of the mineral systems, again, localised into that area. Look at the gray sediments. Again, I'm going to look at the oxidation. You can see that most of the um, very wide range of values, but most of the data sits around zero before 2.7 symbol volcanic time, and then after 2.7 in an oxidation state of magnets, more mag more oxygen and potentially more water in the magnets. Actually, this is what it looks like. We can see that the majority of the central area, which we saw before, tend to be more mantle-like, is more reduced. That kind of makes sense. But we do see in the areas where we have the, most of the BMS systems, so this is Veranda, this is um, Kid Creek, then these actually are in these small zones of oxidized crust. So the oxygen for gas D information is a bit more complex, but very broadly speaking, it mirrors what we see in other systems. In this system, this time slice is for the same volcanic period. If we go to the younger time slice, after the volcanism ended, we see the crust is massively more oxidized. And this is when the, the gold systems are forming. So first of all, the crust has changed a lot. There's much more oxygen in melts now. This is when gold is forming, so we know the association between oxidized melts and gold. But also, the orientation of the gold systems is mirroring the rift architecture. So there's a link there between the, that original architecture and what's happening in the orogenic phase. So you can see here that essentially there's three, there, and it's very broad comparison that there's three very similar zones in that central area, and that's kind of where the mineral deposits tend to be. 
So we've seen two areas that are well mineralized, both have world class mineralization and all provinces. We've learned kind of what types of crust mineral system tend to prefer, what type of architects tend to prefer. So now we're going to go to Southeast Australia, where many of us in this room are working um, on exploring for the future and look at areas an area that's a little bit different. So I want to talk a little bit about exploring for the future. If anybody isn't aware, it's a national geoscience program essentially. We have over $225 million over eight years to do this. And very broadly, it's, it's about increasing that geoscientific understanding of minerals and minerals, energy and groundwater potential um, for Australia, especially in covered areas. That's really the focus. There's multiple projects across Australia. And again, we have this integrated geology, geochemistry, geophysics approach, a huge geophysical programs going on. So I'm going to talk about um, a small focus project. Well, I should just say small, it's like quite a big area, actually. <laughs> but it's compared to the whole of Australia, you know, it's it's relatively small, but it's called Darling Kunamo Danamarian project. We often refer to it DCD, so I'll probably be saying that most of the time. It's a deep dive area and it's really about investigating that potential of how perspective this area may be, because it's mostly covered. And as a national geoscience agency, we're we're thinking about what data sets can we provide that demonstrates the sufficient potential to get industry interested in coming into these areas, which are quite challenging. So one of those data sets is significant new isotopic data acquisition. Um, this will also contribute to the isotopic atlas of Australia. A few years now, Catherine Waltenberg is really the architect of this. This is so we fair to talk about this without mentioning her. It's part of Australia's resources framework. And that is really that project or program, I should say, is really built on building those fundamental data sets on the our geological understanding. So we can then apply those later on. So our topic atlas is all about creating a structured environment for the collection, use and sharing of, of, the, of this isotopic data. And it's, there's a real focus on spatial geochemistry and geochronology. And it really complements all of the other things that GA is doing, especially the geology, geophysics, geochemistry programs. And there's a real focus in GA in, in, in exploring for the future on making sure things are spatial. Can we see the spatial application of the tools we use? This is an example of how we hope Trying to integrate the different data sets. We have geology, bedrock geology on the top, surface, regular stuff, geophysics, and then the isotopic mapping on the bottom. The kind of activities isotopic atlas has been up to. We have large scale data compilation programs, and Sharon Jones really runs that side for us. And it's not a small job. These compilations involve collecting thousands of data points across entire states. And so it's it's a Massive credit to Sharon what she does. There's new data acquisition, which is what I'm going to be showing today, and other people obviously doing that as well. We do fund collaborative research projects, and we have one going on at Curtin University at the moment, which is to do lead isotope mapping of the crustal rocks across Australia, and that's been run by Yana Lehman, postdoc at Curtin. So, I thought we got this really is also focused on unlocking decades of data collection that's been done at GA, and that's been estimated by Jeff and others as being worth over $30 million. So, my work has really been building on that too, where we have lots of existing separates and mounts and going and adding these new data sets that we couldn't collect 20 years ago on the resource that we already have. So, really leveraging all of that work that's been done previously. And finally, there really is a focus on data accessibility in the, in the Atlas. So, being able to go into the portal, look at all the data we have, and really investigate it in, in the So looking at uh, the DCD topic mapping now, just coming towards the end of the talk. So this is essentially the area we're working in. It's got incredibly diverse geology. We have the Archean to view the to protozoic Lawler Craton, the, the Pale Protozoic Olympic Plain. Monon province and then into the Cambrian arc system, which is essentially the Denimarian origin, and then the Paleozoic arc system, the Lachlan origin. So this area covers most of Earth history, <laughs> to be honest. So incredible place to work, really. But it is mostly covered. So you can see everything in yellow is essentially fairly significant coverage of bedrock geology. And most of the mineralization, again shown in the shown in the points down here are localized and concentrated into the exposed rocks. So what can how can we assess the potential of these covered areas as together with the data sets that we collect like geophysics? 
plastoid mapping is one of those things that we're going to try and do. Um, using material from drill holes that have been done in some of these basins, archive samples, and also compiling existing data sets, as well as new sampling. That that we've put together is quite small so far, but it's going to grow a lot over the next 12 months. In green are most of the new analyses that we've done, but there's a lot of um, data compilation um, work from our partnership with the state surveys. Also, this data is mostly from Anthony Reed's paper in um, Canberra Research, so shout out to him for that. There is a, so currently it's 166 samples, over 3,000 analyses, but as I said, I hope this will grow a lot over the next year. Let's look at the early maps. Again, these are very preliminary, so um, well, this is the model age, so as I've been showing before, younger crust in hot colours, older crust in the colder colours, significant margin as you'd expect between the east and the west part of the area where we have the Gawler craton and the, and the older parts of the crust and then the, the, the Paleozoic and Cambrian parts. You can also see this line essentially maps out the, the Tasman line I imagine. You can also see that there's a, a portion of slightly older crust that runs through the Lachlan into Tasmania here. You can see that it's on Hapnium. The reason I put the Epsilon Hapnium and the model age next to each other is because the age of the crust is very useful, but we really want to see how juvenile it was when it formed because that's, as we've seen in the other maps and plots, that's often been the connection between prospectivity and the astrophic system. So we can see that even though this part of the crust is very old in this map, it was relatively juvenile when it formed. So it, we can see that there is a benefit showing these side by side, and this area potentially is quite important that we know about right now. Then we can see that most of them are concentrated into the juvenile areas. We can also say this part of the crust here is significantly reworked when we compare it to like the Gawler, parts of the Gawler, for example. But we should also mention that Stavely is down here, and Stavely is quite unique. It's very juvenile and quite different to any of the other samples I have so far. And this is some geophysics. So this map on the left now, this is the LAB depth. So this is for the thermosphere boundary. Essentially tells us the thickness of the lithosphere. You can see that there's a significant step in this part of the map. So we have thicker lithosphere up here and relatively thin lithosphere here. And this is very step essentially cr cross cuts the Delamarian and some of the arcs, the arc systems. Look at the step here and then compared to the ice map, we do see similar features at this stage, even with a small amount of data that we have. The other piece of the sphere matches what we see in the um, end of the isotopes, this relatively reworked part. So don't really know what it means yet, but just to show the value of building in geophysics with the isotopic maps and that the lithosphere cross system may be off coupled in some way, which could be important. Moving on to the oxygen system. Most of the crust in this area has relatively heavy crustal, so not crustal um, values, sorry, so oxygen values. There is very few mantle values, mainly in the central area. Um, you know, these are actually different ages, so this map eventually will be time sliced to pull out the different different components. We see that the um, eastern part of the map, again, sort of trending in the same way we saw in the more reworked uh, part of the map in, in the Epsilon happening map. This terrain does seem to be fairly consistent between those two maps. And again, more heavy isotopes and this heavy oxygen in the northern section here. We do have areas with. Oh, that was, I should, that's where that was meant to go. There's a few areas I'd like to highlight. First of all, this very heavy area, heavy isotope, oxygen isotope, so significant sedimentary component in these in this cross for some reason. But also these the low values which occur at Stavely and part of the Rodan Nice, these are values which are submantle. So they suggest number one, there's been a high temperature hydrothermal event associated with the magnetism, but also that these signatures are often associated with rifting. So Stavely in particular, as we saw before, there's this high epsilon hapnium in Stavely. There's these submantle oxygen isotopes. This is something we see in magma associated with the Blake River. So what we saw in Superior Crater on the Blake River hosts most of the BMS mineral systems, um, especially the gold 
the gold rich ones. So there's an empirical correlation between those systems, their Archean, but and what we see at Stabley. So the final thing to talk about is the um, oxidation state of the magmas. We only have 32 samples, so the map is very patchy right now. We do see that the um, western part of the map is more oxidized compared to the area around Kulamona, which appears to be more reduced, and especially at Mount Painter, we see very highly reduced magmas, which suggests high temperature crustal remounting uh, in the fairly dry conditions. Um, so this architectural line here, we do, even though it's only on a few samples, we have seen it replicated throughout a number of the maps. So as hopefully as we build more data into this map, we'll start to see more um, in terms of the, how the oxidation of magnus changes over the, the area. And again, more data is going to be collected over the next 12 months. Areas we will be, we'll be focusing in is along the Delam area and into the break of, as we saw in the previous maps. There's some potentially some significant boundaries in there that we aren't able to really constrain right now that we will hopefully be able to do with more samples. So coming to the end of the talk, as we saw in the initial part of the talk, co continental crust is pretty complex, especially as we go back in time. But Zircon, because it's so robust and it's preserved its isotopic signatures for these long periods of time, at, even at high temperatures, offers a unique set of tools to examine the evolution of the past through time and apply it spatially. I hope I've been able to demonstrate that we can map crustal architecture through time using half and oxygen systems, but also trace elements, and that the trace elements are, are providing um, important constraints on things like oxidation, potentially hydration and temperature, which are then really linked into how we transport metals, which metals are we transporting. And I think as we get more samples, being able to look at that spatially will be really valuable. We've shown in the well endowed areas, such as the Yildon Superior, that what we expect from crystal architecture, what isotopic and geochemical characteristics make certain areas perspective, and we can now go the underexplored and covered areas to help identify whether these have potential and which areas have potential. And that really is uh, the area where GA is really focused in exploring for the future. So 